All right, today we are going to talk about common negative feedback op amp topographies. We already covered one of them last Friday, so I won't spend any time deriving it. So we'll start with this guy. And in every case, we are going to make the assumption that our op amp is sufficiently powered to cause it to behave correctly. Um, so let's see, minus plus. R1, RL, let's call this guy R3. All right. So this is very similar to the op amp that we talked about at the end of class on last Friday. I've just thrown a couple of other resistors in into the circuit. Um, so we have a resistor R3 here that wasn't there previously and a resistor RL here at the output that wasn't there previously. To be clear, this is the voltage present at our inverting terminal. Here would be the voltage present at our non-inverting terminal. This is the voltage present at our output terminal and all of those are with respect to ground. So if we apply our ideal op amp equations, uh, so the first one says that V minus is exactly equal to V plus. We apply our second op amp equation, which says that this current is zero amps and this current is zero amps. Step three asks us to determine what the voltage V plus is here. Now, in our example on Friday, the voltage source was connected directly to the non-inverting input pin, so it was simply V in. But what happens if we place a resistor between those two terminals, or between the non-inverting input terminal and our voltage source? Anybody have any thoughts? There's no current, right? So no current can flow through resistor R3 because if current was flowing through resistor R3, it would be flowing into or out of the non-inverting input terminal. Since no current can flow through the resistor R3, what's the voltage drop over resistor R3? Zero volts, right? So that means V plus is still exactly equal to Vn, which means it's gonna behave just like it did with uh, this resistor effectively short circuit, right? So no change in the system. If we apply Kirchhoff's current law at our inverting input terminal, where we're gonna add this current and this current together, we get Vn, divided by R1 <clears throat> plus Vn minus V out divided by R2 is equal to zero. And we found last time that this means V out is equal to Vn times one plus R2 over R1. 
So did the presence of a load resistor here at the output change our output relationship at all? Absolutely not. The only value that will cause this to behave differently is if we short circuit it because it would be forcing the output voltage to be zero. Any other resistor value and the, uh, using the ideal op amp model, it doesn't affect anything. This is what's known as a non-inverting amplifier circuit. Okay. In a non-inverting amplifier circuit, if the input voltage is positive, the output voltage is also positive. It's just scaled by this factor one plus R2 over R1. So that means a couple of things. First, um, our gain can never be less than one. So we can't use a configuration like this to attenuate signals. So we can't make, the output can never be smaller than the input. And uh, the smallest gain that we could ever have would be if R2 was much, much smaller than R1, our voltage gain for the system would approach one. That actually does have its uses though, okay? Um, that would be what's called a buffer amplifier. And what a buffer amplifier does is it effectively disconnects the load from uh, having loading effects on the source. And so, trying to think of a, an easy way to explain this. So loading effects, very basically, Let's say that I had a sensor, okay? And the sensor was producing a voltage signal. So I have a generic sensor. Here's the resistance of the sensor. And then I connect it to a load like this directly. Well, if the load has a similar resistance to the internal resistance of the sensor, then we could see that the voltage drop over the sensor may be significantly smaller. So if RL and RS are approximately the same value, the voltage output of the sensor is cut in half. When RL is very, very large, we don't have this effect. Using the unity gain buffer forces us into a situation where effectively we're looking at an internal resistance of approximately an infinitely large resistance. So we always have the configuration to where we don't have to worry about the loading effects, okay? So that's, that's the use of a buffer amplifier. We can make a slightly better buffer amplifier if we draw the exact same circuit. <clears throat> All right. Like this. So effectively,
if we replace our feedback resistor with a short circuit, <clears throat> what is our output voltage going to be in this system? So we know applying the, uh, if this is V plus, this is V minus is equal to V plus. This current is zero. This current is zero. The voltage present at the non-inverting input terminal is what? Yeah. Because we've short-circuited V out and V minus, we know that V out is exactly equal to V minus, is exactly equal to V plus, is exactly equal to V in. So our voltage gain for this system, AV is V out over V in is equal to what? This is what's called a unity gain buffer amplifier. So we don't have to worry about setting a ratio of resistances. This one specifically forces the output to exactly follow the input on a one-to-one -one scale, all right? And you use this for the exact same reason we talked about previously, avoiding loading effects. All right, uh, the next circuit that I want to look at will employ negative feedback. All these circuits are negative feedback circuits, just to be clear. Here's a resistor R2. Here's a resistor R1. All right, so here's our next circuit. This is the exact same circuit that we analyzed a couple of minutes ago, except that we have changed where we are applying our input voltage and where we are applying ground. So in a non-inverting amplifier, the input voltage is applied potentially through a resistor network to the non-inverting input terminal. And then um, the inverting input was grounded again on the other side of a resistor network. This is the exact same thing, except we've swapped these guys, okay? Uh, and it's going to give us a different characteristic. So, as per usual, this is the voltage V plus. Here is V minus, which is exactly equal to V plus. So, we're applying just op amp rule number one. Up amp rule number two. The voltage present at the non inverting input terminal V plus is going to be what? Zero volts, right? Doesn't, so if the resistor is there or not, doesn't matter. It's going to be zero volts. So now when we apply Kirchhoff's current law at this node, the inverting input terminal node, we have negative Vn divided by R1 plus negative V out divided by R2 is equal to zero. And from this, we can quickly see V out is simply negative R2 divided by R1 multiplied by our input voltage Vn. This is what's known as an inverting amplifier. It's an inverting amplifier because if we put a positive voltage on the input, we get a negative voltage at the output. Um, so we are always changing the sign of the input signal 
notice here that our gain is defined entirely by the ratio of the resistances. So it's just negative R2 over R1, which means we can amplify signals if R2 is greater than R1, and we can attenuate signals if R1 is greater than R2. So we can use this guy to make our output voltage larger than our input or smaller than our input, but it's always going to have that associated negative sign with it. So if we wanted to get rid of that negative sign, we would have to just chain two of them together. And we'll talk about that more on Wednesday. Um, let's see, let's talk about an, another amplifier here real quick. plus negative feedback. I'm going to explicitly call this guy RF. We'll see why in a moment. And then over here, sorry, All right, so what I am trying to illustrate with this guy, uh, just to make things perfectly clear. On this side, looks very similar to what we had for our inverting amplifier that we just talked about a moment ago. But on the left-hand side, instead of having a single input voltage that's being applied through a resistor network to our inverting terminal, inverting input terminal, we now have multiple voltage inputs across multiple resistors, which may have different values. And the relationships that we are about to derive will work for an infinite number of input voltages, okay? So from one input voltage, which means this is exactly the same as an inverting uh, amplifier to N, which would just be, you know, some large number of voltage inputs. All right going through all the basic steps. That's V plus, which means the voltage at this node right here is the same because of ideal op amp rule number one. We know the current flowing in here has to be zero amps. The current flowing in here has to be zero amps. So for this guy, the voltage present at the non-inverting input terminal is zero again, right? Nothing wacky or wild there. When we do Kirchhoff's current law, though, that's where things are going to get a bit interesting. Um, I think I've been using this blue because we're going to have this current plus this current plus this current plus this current plus this current are all, all summed together to be equal to zero. So what that's going to give us is negative V1 over R1 minus V2 over R2 minus V3 over R3 plus uh, minus Vn over Rn minus V out over Rf is equal to zero. And with a little bit of algebra, we get the relationship V out 
is equal to negative RF multiplied by V, uh, sorry, V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2 plus V3 over R3 plus Vn over Rn. This particular amplifier is what's called a weighted inverting summer. It's weighted because the gain applied to each input signal isn't the same, right? So the gain applied to input signal V1 is RF over R1. The gain applied to input signal V2 is RF over R2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If all of these resistors R1, R2 through Rn were equal, our output looks like this. This is just an inverting sum because all of the different inputs are scaled by the exact same factor. So um, the, the summing amplifiers here, particularly the, the inverting summing, we're not going to talk about a non-inverting summing amplifier because when it has more than two inputs, the math gets real ugly, real, real fast. Um, it can be achieved, but the, the scaling gets just real wonky because of the way that it's set up. Um, but we can use a, a weighted inverting summer. Like I could, if I were feeling real weird, I could actually determine you guys' grades in this class by using an op amp system like this, where the input one would be the average score on your exams, the input two would be the average score on your homeworks, stuff like that. I could build a very nerdy circuit for computing your 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 thing, uh, instead of just using Excel, uh, this seems like way more work, but it could be used for something goofy like that. A much more practical application would be um, a load cell. So for example, just to give you guys a use for this guy, Let's say that we have load cells that generate an output of one millivolt for every one kilogram that is applied, okay? And so for instance, I'm gonna have one load cell like this. One load cell over here. I'm just going to write LC, LC. And LC. So we have a system like this. All of the inputs are tied to a particular op amp system. Um,
minus plus here's my feedback Here's V out. All right. What if we wanted to use something like this to weigh a car? All right, this is how a weigh station works, except there's more of them because the tractor trailers have more axles. So this is maybe something that we could do where we could weigh a car. We put one tire, front left tire here, front right tire here, back left tire here, back right tire there. Total weight of the car would sit on all four of those load centers and the signal being generated um, would be scaled by some factor which is determined by our resistors and the output voltage would be reflective of the weight of the car so let's do just that let's design a system to where our output voltage is uh, the number of pounds metric not metric uh, imperial sorry imperial tons that a vehicle weighs Okay, so one ton is 2,000 pounds, right? And one kilogram is 2.2 .2 pounds. We know, assuming all of our resistors on the input side are the same so that each one scales linearly, right? or each one provides the same amount of weighting to the output. We know that the output of our system, V out, is going to be negative RF over R times the voltage generated by load center one plus the voltage generated by load center two plus the voltage generated by load cell three, plus the voltage generated by load cell four, right? What resistor value do we need to use to make the output of this voltage be the weight of the car in imperial tons? Also gonna have a negative sign that we could get rid of later. We have all the information we need, tell me what to do. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by stoichiometry because the last time I heard that word was chemistry class. Okay, dimensional analysis. Sure, that's exactly right. So we know that this guy is going to generate one millivolt for every one kilogram, which means it's going to generate one millivolt for every 2.2 .2 pounds, right? So V load cell is one millivolt for every 2.2 .2 pounds applied to it, right? Um, a ton is 2,000 pounds. So 2,000 divided by 2.2. Sorry, 2.2 .2 divided by 2,000 would be better. This is the same as one millivolt for every 0 0.0011, right? So our total gain then needs to be one divided by 0 0.0011, I believe, right? So the reciprocal of this. 
one, I think. Um, let, let me think about this. All right, so. Let's just think here. If I put one capital T, which I'm going to call one ton, on each of these axles, I want my output to be four volts, right? Let me do this in a different color. The signal generated by each of my load cell would be. By zero point zero zero one. All right. So that means down here I have four volts is equal to negative RF over R times that number multiplied by four, three, six, three, six point three, six, four millivolts, or let's call it 3.636 volts, which means put a negative sign there so that that's taken care of. So that means RF over R needs to be four volts divided by 3.636 volts. Gain of 1.001 and some change. So give me some resistor values that would satisfy this. Should be pretty easy at this point. Yeah, 1.1 K in the feedback. And a 1K there would get it pretty dang close. Right? Simple design problem. All right. Everybody clear on how the inverting summer works then? All right. Now let's look at a differencing amplifier. This one's going to be significantly different. Yes, sir. So I just got rid of it because I know the output of this guy is going to be negative. So if I put one ton on each axle, I should have a voltage of negative four at the output. Yeah, because I can never get, if I put a positive input signal, I'll never get a positive output signal on an inverting style amplifier. So we could chain that into another inverting amplifier, which has an exact gain of negative one to convert our output to positive. But it's intuitively obvious why we can do that, but we're going to talk about cascading amplifiers on Wednesday. All right. Um, let's see here. Start with something generic. All right, so this is the first amplifier that we've looked at where we have an input signal 
applied to the non-inverting input terminal. We could have put a resistor here, doesn't particularly matter as we've shown. And we also have an input signal that is applied to the inverting input terminal, okay? So this guy is gonna behave a bit differently. Um, probably the easiest way to analyze this particular circuit would be to use superposition. So if we turn voltage source V2 off and leave voltage source V1 on, what kind of circuit is this? Go back through your notes. We just talked about it a couple of minutes ago. So this guy is a short circuit. So this means the ground is directly connected to this end of the resistor. And this guy voltage source V1 is on. What kind of circuit is that? That would be a non-inverting amplifier because the input voltage is applied to the non-inverting terminals, right? So using superposition, with V1 on and V2 off, we get V out prime is equal to V1 times one plus R2 over R1, right? So I'm simply stating that when we turn this guy off, meaning we have no voltage applied at V2, it's gonna behave exactly like a non-inverting amplifier. And we already know that a non-inverting amplifier behaves like this. So we don't need to do any circuit analysis whatsoever. Everybody okay with that? That's, that's the point of understanding what these different topologies mean. Now, with V1 off and V2, on, what's this guy look like? So now we're leaving this guy on and we're short circuiting V1. This is an inverting amplifier. So we know that V out double prime is equal to negative R2 over R1 times V2. With both voltage sources on at the same time, this gives us V out is equal to V1 times one plus R2 over R1 minus V2 times R2 over R1. So we are amplifying a weighted version of the difference of these two signals, okay? So anytime that we have an input signal applied at the non-inverting terminal and the inverting terminal, we're going to see something like ha that happen. It's always going to, uh, the output is going to be some weird multiple, these are scaled by different factors of um, the difference. So in this particular case, if R2 were much greater than R1, this would look like V1 minus V2. But we can develop a situation where it will force it to have a, uh, a strict relationship pretty easily as well. So this is a, call this beginning summing or a differencing because we're using this develop a good differencing amplifier. All right, so now let's take this guy.
Call this guy R, call this guy R. Call this guy R, call this guy R. And here's V1. So, a similar amplifier, but what I've done here is I've set all of these resistors Everything but the load resistor has the exact same value. And I have effectively placed a voltage divider circuit at the input on my uh, non-inverting input terminal. So if we use superposition again, let's say with V1 on and V2 off, what are we going to have? So if V2 is off, that means this guy is shorted out, right? This isn't a, sh it, it is a non-inverting amplifier, but it's a non-inverting amplifier with a voltage divider at the input, which is gonna mess things up a little bit. So let's talk about what's gonna happen, right? We know that our output voltage is going to be whatever voltage we have at the non-inverting input terminal multiplied by a factor of one plus R over R, this guy divided by this guy. So it's gonna be twice whatever the voltage is at the inverting input terminal. So what does that voltage divider circuit do? So if we have V1 here, what's the voltage at the non-inverting input terminal? V1 over two. So using superposition with V2 off, V out is exactly equal to V1. All right. Now, with V1 off and V2 on, what does this op amp look like? So if this is ground, then these two resistors are in parallel, but they're both grounded on either side, which means no current can flow through them. So it looks like V plus is grounded. So this would be an inverting amplifier. So we know that V out should be V2 multiplied by a factor of negative R over R is just negative V2. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. See something funny or it doesn't make sense, please let me know. We'll talk about it. All right. So if I combine these results by allowing both voltage sources to be on at the same time, I get simply V out is V1 minus V2. So this is a real differencing amplifier because all it does is take the difference of those input signals. It doesn't scale it by any factor or anything like that. It just, if you have two input signals and you wanna know what the difference between them is, you put them in here and it spits it out. <clears throat> so this is a differencing amplifier. Any questions about this guy before we move on to the next one? And a comparator? So a comparator, it compares the level to uh, a voltage level to a particular reference circuit. And if it's, so if we're talking about strictly a non-inverting comparator, if say V2 was greater than V1, 
it would go high. And if V2 is less than V1, it would saturate to VCC minus. This literally outputs the difference. So if I put five volts on one and three volts on the other, it's gonna give me two volts, not VCC plus or VCC minus. Now that's pretty boring, but if you did different sinusoidal signals, you can see what the difference of that is and that's probably more useful. Um, so as a DC circuit, you could probably get away with doing something much more simple, taking the difference between AC signals. So for instance, um, if you wanted to demodulate a signal in some sense. So let's say that you had um, a voltage signal that varied with time multiplied by a carrier frequency. You could subtract out the carrier frequency port and just see your, your message signal by using something like this. All right, um, how much space do I have? That, that should work. All right, last two that I want to talk about. Uh, let me draw this lower. I'm not going to have room for my feedback resistor where I want. Minus plus. This guy R. Call this guy C. Okay. So things are going to get a little bit more difficult here because we no longer just have a purely resistor based network. So, a couple of things that we may need to recall uh, the voltage drop across the capacitor, VC as a function of time, is one over the capacitor value multiplied by the integral from negative infinity to T of the current flowing through the capacitor with respect to time. And I'm explicitly using um, negative infinity to get away from having to put in some sort of initial condition on this guy, which would make the math harder here. Alternatively, we have the relationship, the current flowing through a capacitor is C times the voltage drop across the capacitor with respect to time. So these guys are going to show up here because we have a capacitor. All right, so we can actually apply the same basic steps. So we know what the voltage here is. That same voltage must be applied right here. V minus is equal to V plus. We know that none of the current can branch off. So this guy is zero and this guy is zero. So <clears throat> if our input voltage is non-zero, meaning it's literally anything other than zero, we should see some current flowing through the resistor, right? Let's call this IR of T. And what should IR of T be? Yeah, Vn over R, exactly right, because if this is effectively grounded, it is that simple. So IR of T is Vn over R, all right? Now we have this capacitor current here, IC of T, right? And that capacitor current has to be the exact same thing is I R of T. So that means 
I assign my polarity for my voltage drop over my capacitor positive polarity on the left hand side so that the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal. We're satisfying the passive sign convention here. That means that VC of T is equal to one over C, the integral one over R of D and DT. So I've simply substituted in my expression for IR into this integral form because I know that IR and IC have to be the exact same thing. And I can do one other thing here real quick just to simplify it. It's going to be 1 over RC integral from negative infinity to T of my input voltage. All right. Anybody got any problems with that? Okay. So now the question is, how do I relate this thing to V out? Well, the voltage at the positive polarity terminal with respect to ground is zero. And the voltage at the negative polarity terminal of my capacitor with respect to ground is V out. So what that means is that V out as a function of time is simply negative VC as a function of time is negative one over RC integral from negative infinity to T of VN DT. So guess what this guy is called? An integrator. All it does. Integrates our input signal. This is a fundamental building block of automatic control systems. Now, if we change our setup slightly, and we place the resistor in the feedback position and the capacitor between the inverting input terminal and our input signal. We get a different response. So, this is V plus, which means V plus is exactly equal to V minus. No current can flow into the input terminals. Let's call this VC. This guy, I see. So how can we express VC in terms of our input voltage? That looks crappy. Any thoughts? They're exactly equal, right? So VN with respect to ground is the exact same thing as the voltage drop over the capacitor of this terminal minus the voltage drop over this guy, which is at zero, which is at ground. So VC is exactly equal to VN, which means IC is C times the derivative of the input voltage as a function of time. Right? That current IC 
is the exact same thing as this resistor current, IR of T, where we can express IR of T is negative V out divided by R, right? Zero minus V out divided by R is the current flowing through the feedback loop from left to right. Which is exactly equal to IC of T because of ideal op amp rule two. So from this, we get V out as a function of time is negative one divided by RC, sorry, derivative VN with respect to time. Hold on, I, I might have done that. I might be might be supposed to be R times C. Let me let me do the algebra here so I don't screw this thing up again like I did the last time. C D V N by D T. All right, so these two guys are equal. Yeah, so it should be negative R times C. When I get V out by itself. There we go. All right, sorry about that. So this is also a fundamental building block of autonomous control systems. This is the differentiator. So um, typically speaking on the first test, I'm going to give you guys something different because I'm going to talk about this, but I give a design problem. And one of the design problems that I give is usually something about how we can use a comparator to generate a particular square wave output. And then we can use either an integrator or a differentiator. And I, I'm saying you need to determine which one we could use this. So if we fed a square wave into an integrator, what would we get? I take that back. If we fed a yeah, if, if we feed a sawtooth wave into a differentiator, we get a square wave. So if we feed a square wave into an integrator, we should get the sawtooth and vice versa. But, so that's how the different types of waveforms are generated within an analog wave generator, is using these guys to be able to convert from one to the other. Uh, creating the sinusoidal bit is actually the hardest part. Everything beyond there is pretty trivial. And that's usually done by modulating the frequency of the voltage from the AC power. Um, all right, we finished 15 minutes early today, so uh, I guess that's all out of me. Anybody have any questions regarding the homeworks they want to talk about for the next 15 minutes, or you guys just want to bounce? Either way is fine by me. I've placed um, homeworks. Oops, let me go to web work real quick. Not web work. On, there we go. So if we go here, just to be clear, we look at so positive feedback op amp circuits. That, that homework has been uploaded. That's due this Friday. It's three problems, the first two of which should take no more than probably three minutes a piece. Um, it's real, real simple. I literally, let's just take a quick peek at it. I give you a non-inverting Schmidt trigger and give you parameters and ask you to calculate the upper trigger limit and the lower trigger limit. It's the exact same thing we did in class. The only thing that's slightly hard about it, I guess, is that VREF isn't zero, but the equation still works. Second problem, is a inverting Schmidt trigger. I ask you to calculate the upper and lower trigger limit, which is again, just using the exact equation in class and then a simple simulation. Problem three, slightly difficult, I guess. Um, I give you some parameters and I just ask you to calculate the frequency range over which this guy operates because this R varies from 0 0.1 to 100 kilohertz. So if you calculate T and then take the, 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 the period, 
for the low resistance value. And then you calculate T to find the period for the high resistance value. And then if you take the inverse of those numbers, that's going to give you the, this will give you the low, no, the high frequency. This will give you the low frequency. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, then the homework for negative feedback op amp circuits and the common topologies that we just talked about here. Two circuits I want you to use the practical model on just like the examples we did in class and tedious but not particularly difficult. Here's a gnarly looking op amp circuit that I want you to analyze using the ideal op amp rules. You're going to have to break out some circuit one technique. Uh, I guess technically you don't have to, but it might make it easier. So you could analyze this by finding, applying the ideal op amp rules, finding B plus, and then applying KCL here. Uh, another way to approach this would be if you do a source transformation here, combine these resistors, combine these resistors, you will see that it is a differencing amplifier of some sort, and it's really easy to figure out from there. Problem four is just an awkward looking circuit where I want the output voltage. Um, it's negative feedback, it's just got a weird Wheatstone bridge configuration at the input that you're going to have to play around with. And then problem five is literally doing what I just did for either a differentiator or an integrator, but we have an inductor instead of a capacitor. So this particular homework set is due January the 4th. So the Monday we get back at 5 p.m. So you got you're out for two weeks so three weeks to do it um it's just two of those weeks are over the break so you're probably not going to do it then so um, that's why i'm not making it do at class time none of them are but for this particular reason of you can totally have an oh shit i didn't do my homework moment and still probably have plenty of time to knock all this stuff out before 5 p.m um all right so if anybody has any questions Feel free to ask them. If not, I need to give you guys a roll sheet thing to fill out real quick and then we'll call it a day.